you look at your textbook, or if you just Google Smith & Album, some of the founders of Qualtrics, you'll see that they categorize surveys, one of the most common types of marketing research, into 20 different typologies. In other words, the point they're trying to make here is that marketing problems that we solve with research are so common, you can look at any given survey and categorize it into one of 20 different categories. We're not going to cover all of those categories here, but to illustrate what they mean, let's take a look at these three. Number seven is a new product concept analysis survey. In other words, many marketers are confronted with the challenge of trying to figure out before they even produce a new product or service or app or whatnot, they really don't know what consumers uh, might like or what they might initially react to. Survey or experiments can be useful to screen some of these new product concepts. Their ninth uh, type of research uh, was a habits and uses surveys. It's pretty self-explanatory. For a given product category or lifestyle, these surveys are designed to figure out the sort of daily habits, weekly or monthly, that people do use related to their products or the way of living. Take a look at this real survey question from a 2020 survey conducted for the HTC Vive Pro. This is a virtual reality headset system. Notice that this survey question asks about people's habits and uses specific to the HTC virtual reality system, asking these individuals about the particular activities that they engage in while actually using the system, such as gaming, educational or school, or other utilizations. A final example that I'll show here is a price setting survey and elasticity of demand surveys. One of the most challenging things for a marketer to do is to figure out exactly what the optimal price of a product should be so that it maximizes profitability. This is particularly challenging when the product hasn't been brought to market yet or there's not a lot of empirical evidence already available. In these situations, surveys and experiments can be useful to find how consumers respond to different price points for a given product or service. An example where a price setting survey might be appropriate is in the context of high fashion face covering masks. In a June 18, 2020 article on Vogue.com, there's a variety of different manufacturers and brands that are offering high priced, stylish and fashionable cloth face coverings. Take a look at this particular example here. If the manufacturer was trying to figure out exactly what price to set this particular product at, they could conduct a price setting survey. They would provide respondents with an image and description, and then present to them the price they're considering to sell the product at. They would ask the person how likely they are to purchase the product at this price. A different subset of individuals would be shown the exact same images, but the price that they'd be shown is slightly different. By varying the different levels of prices, and then comparing it against the different probabilities that people would express that they'd buy these products, it's possible to determine what price is likely to be the optimal price for the manufacturer to optimize profitability. Another way to characterize research is to categorize it as either basic or applied research. In reality, this is a false dichotomy. Most research falls somewhere along a continuum of these two things, but it's useful to think of these as two separate things for the moment. Basic research is the kind of research that I think of as being more science or academic-y. That is, it's trying to answer broad, general truths about how humans behave in the world. On the other hand, applied research is a little more immediate and pragmatic. There's usually a very specific marketing problem confronting a very specific business or industry, and a study was set out and designed to answer that question very specifically. Here's an example of applied research from Nielsen. You may actually want to Google this craft beer shelf buster study. It's a really fun website and you can actually interact with a lot of the survey results and guess to see how much you understand about the craft beer marketplace. This study was done in 2016 and what it set out to do was to find out how craft beer consumers interact and react to different types of packaging decisions for craft beers. Just highlighting one of the results here on the bottom right hand side, uh, one of the survey questions that was asked of respondents in this particular study was when choosing a craft beer, which physical attributes of the package tend to make the strongest impression on you? If you look at the bottom there, the design of the package itself and where it was produced were the two most commonly selected items. Hmm, looks like that local home field advantage that's sometimes talked about in the craft beer industry is alive and well. Now, this research can be very useful and very practical for anybody who's interested in selling or consuming craft beer, but it might not give us broader truths about how packaging and how consumers react to them in the marketplace. Another example of applied research comes from an interesting company called Adormi. Adormi is an online lingerie company, but they're also like extremely data-driven. Uh, you may again want to read this article uh, coming, coming from Fast Company that talks about all the different ways that Adormi uses AB, or in other words, online experiments to figure out what sort of content does the best job at selling 
uh, selling lingerie products. But what's interesting here is rather than just guessing about the best way to pose a model or the best type of model to have wear a particular piece of lingerie to sell it online, what they do with Adore Me is they try multiple different variations and then randomly show those different variations to consumers and see how people react. In other words, do they buy, do they buy products more frequently when a model is sitting or standing? Uh, an interesting quote directly from the article, through its research, Adore Me has found that the right model matters even more than the price. If customers see a lacy push-up on a model they like, they'll buy it. Put the same thing on a model they don't, and even a $10 price cut won't compel them. Let's take a look at basic research. Basic research in marketing often comes from academics. A lot of peer-reviewed journals publish marketing articles, the Journal of Marketing, Journal of Marketing Research, amongst many. Basic research also often comes from industry groups, or it may come from marketing research firms in the real world looking to answer broad questions, such as Nielsen. This article from the Journal of the Association for Consumer Research called Call Me Raleigh, the role of brand nicknames in, nicknames in shaping consumer brand relationships, provides an interesting insight for a wide array of marketers. In this study, they wanted to see how different consumers reacted to brands when the nickname for the brand was used rather than its formal name. In a laboratory experiment, researchers found that brand nicknames, for example, like Wally World rather than Walmart, uh, when the brand nickname was highly relevant to the brand, it increased purchase intentions of the brand. Now what's important here is that these researchers set out to answer broad, general questions about how humans process and interact with nicknames. In fact, the theories that they drew from actually first started with how people talking to other people react to nickname use rather than formal names. So these, this research doesn't directly tell Target whether they should refer to themselves as Target or Walmart might refer to itself as Wally World, but it does provide interesting insights that could be useful to a wide array of marketers. Here's another example. An article was published called On the Reception and Detection of Pseudo-Profound Bullshit. This is a real article, by the way, from a peer-reviewed journal. In this article, they defined bullshit in an academic sense. They said, bullshit, in contrast to mere nonsense, is something that implies but does not contain adequate meaning or truth. As an example, attention and intention are the mechanics of manifestation. Essentially, the, the author's definition tried to argue that bullshit claims are those kind of things where they are technically sentences and they have content, but they mean something so wide and so diverse and so broad to such and so idiosyncratic to every person reading it, it doesn't really have any uh, concrete meaning. In this study, what they tried to do was they tried to figure out what kinds of people are more prone to accept pseudo-profound bullshit. In other words, what type of personality traits predict the type of people who are more likely to find pseudo-profound bullshit to have meaning versus those types of people who are less likely to think it has deep meaning? Here's some other examples. We exist as electromagnetic resonance. To traverse the path is to become one with it. In this study, they presented people with a whole bunch of different so-called pseudo-profound bullshit statements, have them ranked, have them ranked and scored how profound they thought those statements were. In addition, they also took a bunch of personality measures, and then they took the correlations. You may recall for correlations, a correlation of one means perfect positive relationship. A correlation of zero means there is no linear relationship between the two concepts, and a correlation of negative one indicates that there's a negative linear relationship between the two concepts. Looking at the top row here, they found that people, as people scored higher on the ontological confusion scale, they were also more likely to score high on the bullshit receptivity scale. Um, ontological confusion is defined as the degree to which a person confuses literal and metaphorical truths. Uh, as an extreme example, if I was to say it's uh, raining cats and dogs, um, it's not literally raining cats and dogs. So uh, on the other hand, look near the bottom there, as people scored higher on verbal on a verbal intelligence, this is a standard test sort of um, assessing the degree to which someone um, successfully links synonyms together. Um, as, as someone scores higher on verbal intelligence, it's negatively correlated uh, with so-called bullshit receptivity. And then in the middle there, you may notice that paranormal beliefs Faith and intuition and religious beliefs are all positively correlated with so-called pseudo-profound bullshit receptivity. So this is a basic research study. This study in of itself clearly has no explicit direct recommendation for any marketer. However, perhaps this type of study could be useful to a marketer. When marketers are confronted with interesting basic research results, 
we're often asking ourselves, well, if these results are true, how might they apply to our unique circumstance? For example, imagine that you were a marketer interested in selling so-called healing crystals. If these results are actually true, as presented here, how might that indicate what types of phrases, terminology, and content you might include in order to sell those so-called healing crystals? Another way of describing types of marketing research is to recognize the differences between exploratory, descriptive, and causal research, and identify the difference between primary and secondary data or research. First, let's quickly d distinguish between primary research and secondary research. Primary research is that research that you conduct yourself for a very specific purpose. In other words, with the research question that you have, you design the study, you collect the data, you analyze the data, and you present the results. Secondary research, on the other hand, is that research that was produced by somebody else, but you intend to make use of it. Of course, this is often quicker, faster, and more convenient. The frustration about secondary research is often that it may not be perfectly designed for your needs, and you must make an informed judgment about whether or not it's still appropriate. Exploratory research is that kind of research where your research question is often a little bit ambiguous. Uh, you're trying to gain background information, define terms, clarify problems and hypotheses. In other words, you know that there's something worth studying, but you're still so unclear about what exactly is going on, you really aren't able to formalize in a precise research question yet. So let's give an example of exploratory research in a primary research example and a secondary research example. So a primary research example might be shadowing various business-to-business -business sales teams in an organization to develop, a, to develop a broad understanding of the teamwork habits, sales techniques, and common pitfalls. So in this situation, clearly, um, if you are a, in a B2B sales situation, uh, knowing how your sales teams behave, interact, perform is very important. But in this situation, if you're simply shadowing them, you're just looking um, open-mindedly to a variety of different things they may do. You don't know precisely what you're looking for yet. You're looking for those aha moments, things that might intrigue you. As a secondary research example, maybe you analyze recorded customer service calls to develop an understanding of triggers that escalate or diffuse irate customers. So imagine if you're the manager of a call center, and no surprise, a lot of times people call in and are rather upset. An interesting question might be, what are those specific phrases that your service reps use that tend to seem to induce or diffuse uh, customers becoming really angry. If you just explore those service calls, you could maybe document and observe any intriguing observations that you might make about when those things occur. Then later, you could follow that up with more rigorous study. Descriptive research is the type of research where your, int your main intention is to quantify something. I think of it as who, what, where, when, and how. For those of you who took an introductory journalism class, you'll notice I said all of them, except for why. Descriptive research is when we want specific, rigorous quantities, percentages, counts, correlations, differences in averages, and so on. It's my experience, I think when new marketing researchers think about typical marketing research, they're often thinking about descriptive studies. So as a primary research example, imagine we collect survey data to understand common cell or smartphone usage behaviors amongst teens by age, gender, and phone type. In other words, do younger teens tend to use different apps than older teens? Or maybe iPhone teen users play different games than Android users. As a secondary research example, we could be analyzing U.S. Census data to develop market segments based on geography and income. So what do we do if we actually want to answer a why question? We actually want to know what causes some other thing to happen. And when you think about marketing, in the end, everything really boils down to a why question. As marketers, we are very interested in understanding why people do things, because we make interventions to try to change or alter their behaviors. If I do this, then how will my consumer or customer respond? If we want to do causal type research, we really only have one option. Experiments are really the only tools available to us to truly investigate causal questions. So as an example, for primary research, maybe we conduct a conjoint analysis, it's a type of experiment, to determine the optimal bundle of attributes to offer for a new touchscreen laptop. In other words, we know everybody wants the best memory, the best battery life, the best keyboard, and the best screen, but we don't know exactly what price we can sell that at, and we know that we would much rather make sure that at a given price point we give people the features they do want, and maybe make some trade-offs on the other features that aren't as important so that we can make sure we have a nice profit. Now for secondary research, it's a little harder to come up with good causal research examples because you have to do an experiment. 
when you're looking when you're looking at data that already exist out in the real world, sometimes it's trickier to actually find examples of experiments. But some things that we do uh, is something called a natural experiment. In other words, a natural experiment is simply rather than a formal experiment that we do ourselves, something spontaneously happens in the real world that we argue, and again it's rhetorical, that something that happened out in the environment actually effectively makes something like an experiment. In other words, we have a treatment and a control, and we intend to compare those results. So an example of this might be, we want to see how our competitive react, how our competitors react to our various marketing actions. We're going to treat those competitive reactions as, as essentially experimental treatments and see how those different how those differences in their reactions impact our effectiveness. Again, this isn't really an experiment, but rather we're arguing it qualifies as an experiment.